As actors, we get to rely on scripts to tell us what to do. Like when to slap someone across the face and when to let someone slap you. But we don't need a script to tell us to help someone in need. The SAG Foundation was founded to do just that, to help performers with life's unscripted moments and to give back to our communities. Over the past decade, the SAG Foundation has given millions in financial and medical assistance to SAG after performers and their families. Last year, more than 25,000 union performers attended over 500 SAG Foundation Q&As, seminars, and workshops. And SAG Foundation Book Pals read to over 60,000 children in schools every month nationwide. Do you know how much SAG After members pay for all these resources and programs? Zero. Zero. Zilch. Nada. Do you know how much of our union dues go to the SAG Foundation? Zero. 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 The SAG Foundation is a nonprofit that relies solely on donations, so it is vital that those who are able to help give what they can. And you've been giving since the SAG Foundation was founded in 1985. I love 1985. Out of Africa. The color purple. The Goonies. The Cosby Show. Family time. The Golden Girls. What? So many truly fantastic performances since then. We have a wonderful history and a beautiful tradition of being there for one another. If you need help, it's here for you. And if you can help, please give. Like every great production, we are at our best when we all act together. 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 So please, act now. Hi, I'm, uh, yikes. Uh, I'm Ben Svetke from The Hollywood Reporter, and I'm going to be moderating this tonight. Um, I was telling some of the people backstage that I've been waiting since I was 17 years old to meet some of them, so this is pretty exciting for me as well. Um, I don't know who's coming out first, but let's, uh, let me put my glasses on first here. Uh, I think Gloria Hendry might be coming out first. You probably... Uh, Remember, <laughs> you probably remember Gloria from uh, Live and Let Die. You'll obviously remember Gloria from Live and Let Die. She played Rosie. She was, you were, as I, if I'm correct, you were the first African American woman, a Bond girl, to have an actual relationship with James Bond. Is that correct? That's what they say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, Trina Parks may be here a little later. She was also, I think she was the first African-American Bond girl who Period. didn't have a relationship with James. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, there's also Lynn Holly Johnson here tonight. <laughs> Bebe from Your Eyes Only. I, th I think you probably, probably have the distinction of being the only Bond girl who tried to seduce James Bond and didn't get anywhere with it. So. <laughs> Yes, we have a panel full of winners here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. no, I tried hard, and that's as far as I got. But you kind of stole the movie anyway, so oh, you got the last one. Um, and we also have somebody, some guy named George Lazenby, who... Uh, distinction of being the only Australian James Bond and also one that, that a lot of fans have an enormous amount of affection for and, and really kind of wish in another alternate universe you'd been able to do three or four more of them. So it's uh, very nice to see you here tonight. Um, I guess I'm, I'm going to start um, ladies first. So uh, I'll start with Gloria. When you, when you made um, Live and Let Die, it was uh, a different era, and it was somewhat controversial. There were a lot of sort of uh, racial undertones to it. And in fact, if you were in South Africa when it came out, you never saw the love scene that you shot with Roger Moore because it, it was illegal to show that in South Africa at the time. Um, and even here, it was a, a bit controversial. Um, what do you remember about that, or remember about making the movie about that controversy in particular, 
Um, and then about the love scene with Roger Moore. You know, I have to tell you, and you're working actors here, when you're working, you're working. You have no idea what's going on outside of your concentration on working. I mean, all the other people, you know, people outside of our community, you know, the, they just have no idea of the kind of concentration we have to have because we begin to worry about what the public is thinking about. We can't even begin to perform. We'll be editing. And we wouldn't be able to be cre creative. Am I correct? So, I'm, I mean, my world at that time and those months that I spent with wonderful human being, Roger Moore, Guy Hamilton, the production the company is just like when you're working with a wonderful company that's very creative. You're having a blast. We're having a good time. We're in gowns and tuxedos on Friday with the champagne, the first class hotels. I mean, the limousines taking you to work. I mean, are you spoiled or what? <laughs> I mean, Vaughn really spoiled us, first class, and madam, would you like to have, um, who would you, and first of all, let me say, I'm a little ghetto girl. <laughs> I had never had a passport. I had never flown to Europe. I had never, probably, I, the only place I can think of is that my mother flew me from Florida, you know, to, um, to, New, to from Florida to New Jersey, and that's the only time I remember flying until then. To make a long story short, yes, after the fact, <laughs> after the movie was over, is when I realized, and, and, and as I was doing my love scene, I had no idea of all of that. With Roger, we were having fun. And I'm on top of him, and he's married to an Italian woman. <laughs> <laughs> And the night before, I had garlic. <laughs> and you and get I'm killed lying at on, the end, too. Huh? And you die at the end as well, right? Yes, and on, I'm on top of him with the garlic, and I finally go, <sighs> and he goes, you're lucky my wife is Italian. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the crux of the scene. I mean, really, in that reality, and then there's a the scarecrow, <gasps> you know, etc. So we were having a blast. No, not until after it was over. Uh, fans were telling me about my film, my segment being cut out of the movie in various places all over the country. And I'm going, wow, that's incredible. So this wasn't just happening in South Africa, this was happening no, in... right here. Amazing, amazing. Yes, it was, it's amazing. Well, <laughs> uh, it's, um, let's... When I say amazing only from the point of view of, is that at this time and place, and I remember our wonderful um, Di um, Dorothy Dandridge. She, he, she played a huge role, and she had a love interest with a, a Caucasian. And this was way back in the 50s. I mean, that was then. Yeah. So we we're still moving forward, and it's Sidney Poitier, and guess who's coming to dinner? I mean, come on. And here we are with 73. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is astonishing. Um, well, we'll come back to that. Uh, explore that a little bit more, but um, Lynn, you started out, you did not start out as an actress, you started out as an ice skater, and yes. then Ice Castles came along with Robbie yes. Benson. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, <laughs> that made you a star, Roger Ebert was extremely uh, uh, impressed with you oh, as an actress. Um, yeah. And then, so yes. how did you uh, end up uh, skating with James Bond? Uh, well, Cubby Broccoli really liked Ice Castles. And um, they wanted to put uh, a young gal in there after Roger. So this was not written by Ian Fleming, this character. So uh, they created this gal. Uh, I went to meet Cubby in his mansion. Just unbelievable. Uh, atrium, you know, just a huge atrium. And um, there was a chair, and there was Cubby sitting in the chair, and, and I sat down, and we chatted, and um, they kind of thought that this was a swell idea to have this young gal after Roger, and um, it was written by Michael Wilson, and I guess Who's Cubby. now the, one of the producers. Yes, uh, yes. Um, well, was, there was a sort of wink here that Roger Moore's getting a little bit old 
for the first time in this movie. I mean, that, that's the way I interpret it anyway. I mean, you know, it... um, uh, perhaps chronologically, but um, at the time, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, charisma is charisma, right? Yeah. Right. yeah. Right. So, you know, a, a, a James Bond, oh my goodness, you know. <laughs> you guys have the charisma, and it doesn't matter. Chronologically, that doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. uh, Mr. Lazenby, um, you landed the part. I, I may be totally wrong about this, but it seems like you kind of bluffed your way into the part of James Bond for the most part. You were a, a male model at the time, and can you tell the story of, of how you managed to convince this multi-million dollar enterprise to put an Australian model in front of the entire thing? Well, I just walked in with a drunken swagger and said, hey, mate, you need James Bond? I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's partly true. I uh, had a friend who wanted to be an actor, and he double dated. And he asked me, could I take this agent out? Her name was Maggie Abbott with CMA or ICM now. And I took her out. I won't tell you what happened. But... <laughs> I went to Paris the next day, and where I was working as a male model, I'd burned out in London, being such a good-looking guy. And I literally couldn't get a job. I, did, I already did every commercial going. And that was my, and this is what backfired on me, because when I went over for the job, Maggie called me up and said, you gotta come back here, you're right for a part that I think that they're having trouble finding a guy for. And I said, what is it? And she wouldn't tell me, so I hung up the phone and forgot about it. Then I went to Ken's place, my friend in London, and he said, geez, what did Maggie want you for? She's calling everywhere. Dan, oh, I know. And he said, come on, I'll take you up there. And he took me up there and made him wait outside and said, it's James Bond. I think you're right for it. Why is that? I just think uh, they're looking for someone with your kind of arrogance. <laughs> 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 and uh, it was uh, one of those things. So I went up for the job and... Uh, I couldn't get in at first because I wasn't, uh, she couldn't get me an appointment because I wasn't in a union. So when I got uh, to the door, they threw me out and I said, Maggie, they threw me out. And this is the part that's going to be hard to believe for actors. Because I uh, went away and I got my hair cut where Connery got his hair cut. I went and got a suit that he didn't want that had the sleeves were a little short. I got the sleeves lengthened and it fit me perfectly. And then uh, I walked up to the door again I saw the girl and she ducked under a desk for something and I screamed up the stairs there was only one office above hers and I'm standing at the door with my Rolex and he's on the phone with Harry Saltzman if he hadn't been on the phone with Harry Saltzman he'd have found out I was full of shit so <laughs> he said who are you I said I heard you're looking for James Bond you know my best English accent and so <laughs> he said Harry there's a guy here that looks like the role already and uh, and Harry says bring him over so on the way over I, now this will help a lot of actors because I was shitting myself <laughs> at this stage this guy's real serious you know and he's uh, and so is Harry's even worse and Harry I go in the room and I've already told Dyson Lovell the casting director all the bullshit I could think of where I'd made movies in Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia <laughs> and China and everywhere he couldn't I thought he couldn't check on and then <laughs> We get in there, and, and uh, Harry's got his feet up on the desk, and I got a thing about sitting in front of people's feet. So uh, he points at the chair in front of his feet to sit down, because he's on the phone. He's always on the phone. And so I walked over and looked out the window. He told me later he was quite impressed with that. Because, <laughs> you know, you expect every actor does what he's told. Yeah. And then he asked me, uh, he said, tell me your life story. And I said, oh, shit, I just told him a bunch of lies. I won't remember. So I said, I just told him, let him tell you. And so he went, oh, oh, oh yeah, Dyson told me the story. <laughs> and he told me later, those two things got his attention. And he said, you were so sure of yourself, but I was shitting myself. <laughs> and I thought, how am I going to act? If they get me to give me the part, I won't be able to act. So uh, he said uh, the, to Dyson, he said, when's the director coming back, Peter Hunt? Oh, he's in Switzerland doing uh, location hunting, but he'll be back here at 4 o'clock tomorrow. You'll be here at 4 o'clock tomorrow. And I said, I can't. I don't know where that line came from. It was, it was like, I was shitting myself. You know? I thought, I've got to get out of here. I just told too many lies. And so, um, next thing I know, 
Next thing I know, he said, uh, what are you doing in Paris? I said, I'm doing a movie. Yeah. Oh, yeah? <laughs> what do you, what do you uh, how much do they pay? I said, 500 pounds a day. That, that's like 50 weeks wages in England in those days, right? And he says, go down and see Stanley Sapel, who's still alive. He'll give you 500 pounds. Be here at 4 o'clock tomorrow. And I didn't know actors didn't get paid for callbacks. So I went down. I went down, got my 500 quid. He tried to knock it down. He couldn't understand what it was for. Because Harry just said, give this guy 500 quid when he comes down. And, and Stanley said, what's it for? It says for me to come back tomorrow. So I'll give you 250. I said, no, forget it. No, no, go, go. Come back here. And he's, all this was going on. So then I get out in the phone booth, and I ring Maggie up. And she said, how'd you do? I said, they gave me 500 quid to come back tomorrow. <laughs> And she, said, she says, where are you? I said, I'm in a phone booth right across my office. I'm coming down to see this. <laughs> and she couldn't believe I got this check for 500 quid. So that night I went looking for an acting coach. <laughs> I did. And I found this guy, Ronan O'Reilly, who became my manager. And so... He's, he's got me doing an acting lesson, and I, I'd never had, an, I had no clue. I'd never spoken in front of a camera in my life. So he said, I'm going to, by this stage, he's got like four or five of his mates there, because I told him I'm up for James Bond. He said, you've got to come and see this ridiculous character. He's, and so all his mates there, and he said, I'm going to do something. I'm going to hide a key in the room. You'll be able to see it. I want you to go out of the room. We'll hide the key, and then you walk in and point at it. I came back in, and I'm looking around everywhere, and he said, look between your feet. There it was, the key. And he said, now try it again. And he said, you're thinking about what we're thinking about. You're wondering what we're thinking about you, and you're not being able to see the key. Now do it again. So I got that, and I went back out, and he hid just a little bit was shown behind a picture on the shelf. I went, there. He says, you can act. <laughs> Don't ask me where this came from, because I found out later on it didn't work. But <laughs> meanwhile, meanwhile uh, the next day I go back, and Peter Hunt's there, and he's pissed. And I'm sitting down in front of him. And he's uh, a gay guy. And he had all his friends over in Switzerland. They were going to have a weekend together. And Harry said, get your ass back here. <laughs> Delighted to see this guy. So he, he's not real happy to see me. And uh, I'm sitting in front of him. And something made me say it, the truth. I said, Peter, I've never acted before in my life. Never spoken in front of a camera. I've modeled in front of him. And he says, what? He looks at me, what did you just say? I said, I've never. They brought me all the way back here from Switzerland to see you. And he says, stick to your story and I'll make you the next James Bond. I said, but I can't act. He said, you can't act. You fooled two of the most ruthless men I've met in my life. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we go over there and then Harry and Cubby both know that I've done it. They've got my commercials going and, and pictures. They've, you know... And I'm sitting there looking at that. He said, get him out of here. He's a close pick. And Peter says, I want to test him. He said, you're not testing him at the studio. He'll be the laughing stock of the industry. He said, model. I want to test him. I'll test him at your place, out in the country. But the camera crew, they'll spread the word around. We're testing a male model for James Bond. Anyway, Peter got his way. And I was four months out there at Harry's place. I had to uh, swim. And I could swim like a fish, so I dived in the pool and come up at the other end. He said, no, we want to see you swim. I was doing everything wrong, you know. And then we want to see you ride a horse. I jumped on it bareback, because I've been riding horses since I was a kid, and rode it around without a bridle until it ran out of steam. And then uh, I said, well, we can ride. And I only had to walk it in the movie, <laughs> just walk along in the bushes. <laughs> but meanwhile, uh, and then the fight scene, well, that was the big one at the end after four months. United Artists said they don't want him to see him fight. And Peter Hunt said, he's Australian. Of course he can fight. <laughs> so, no, we want to see it. So the stuntman gave me about a five-minute rehearsal. And so I was good with the first two that came at me. And the third one, I forgot, and I hit him. Boom. Yuri Borienko, a Russian wrestler. I'm thinking, oh, Jesus, when he gets up, this is going to be a problem. And so Harry steps over him and comes up and grabs my arm and takes me over the wall. He says... We're going with you. And I'm not kidding. I said, it's about time. He said, what? I said, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it was just uh, spontaneous, you know. So he said, we're going to teach you to walk a different way because it's cinema scope and you walk like this. Because I used to walk like this. You know? He said, and we're going to teach you an English accent. Uh, so they had a, a match in my mouth. You know, not him, the, the teacher. 
and then she had a foot on my stomach because you got to get, create this bagpipe, she said, so that when you're nervous on the set, you've always got the air there to get the lines out. And believe me, that was clever. That was a good thing I learned. And uh, the accent. And Harold Wilson, the Prime Minister of England, was going to her because half of England couldn't understand him. He had this... <laughs> well, let me, let, me, let me interrupt you here. I have a quick question for you guys as well here. Um, the thing about James Bond movies is generally... James Bond gets to come back um, for more, but Bond girls generally don't. So you have this experience for three or four months or however long you're shooting, where I think you described it, the, the lifestyle pretty elegantly. Um, it's unlike anything else in movies, really, and then you're gone. Um, is, is it tough to adjust to life after James Bond? Um, does it spoil you as an actress or or even as a person in a way? I mean, how do, you, how do you pick it up after, how do you top James Bond after that? I don't, I don't think you get spoiled by it. Um, I think as an actress, um, y you, are just, you are just programmed to look for the next job. And when you have a, a passion for playing a character, you kind of don't care where you're acting right or what the budget is when you read something you say i gotta do that you know and i don't care if they're gonna serve tea at three in the afternoon and break down the set like on a james bond movie yeah. you know i don't care they really if, do that they would they would stop production and serve tea at three yes right oh, yeah. so oh, yeah. civilized yeah. Yeah. Or, or drinks yeah <laughs> they always had uh, what was that Bond drinks, I hate the Martinis? Martinis. <laughs> <laughs> Shaken, not stirred. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, Diane wanted this uh, champagne, which I didn't like either. <laughs> but the tea was nice, I assume. Yes. You know, the sandwiches and stuff. But, 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 out of all of that to say, I slept yeah. on many floors. Black exploitation films. The, the, the turning of independent filmmaking for me. And um, Black Caesar is a Turner classic today with Fred Williamson. So therefore I slept on many floors, worked 24 hours, or hardly had any, only sleep, sleeping that I had was on the floor. And then we're ready, madam, and I'm my makeup person, I'm my dress person, I supply everything. So I came from that area. So when Bond came, it was like, what? First class? <laughs> what? Champagne? What? Gowns? What? My own maid? Oh my God, my own, <laughs> I got my own room and I got a cook who cooks for me? Oh my God, and a limousine to ride in? Oh my God. <laughs> so when that was over, I was looking for that. <laughs> I don't blame and you. I never found it. I never found it since. I haven't. Because, put it this way, Bond has a special way. The Bond production has a very special way of treating us. I, I, I don't know anybody who he even done a very, very, very wealthy $40 million movie that could really top their way of catering to you, making you feel like you're a millionaire, a multi-billionaire today. I think also um, uh, so many of the crew uh, have worked together in so many Bond films, so it's a fantastic family, and it's neat to go, to, go into another movie where you hope that you're going to find that family. I mean, every movie is, is a puzzle that you hope will get put together at the end. And you have all these pieces, you know, even with the guy that first sat down and wrote page one of the script, right? But you hope that with all these puzzles, you hope that there is that cool family feeling that is so present on a Bond movie. And people have been making them together for decades. So, so I, I think we're gonna do questions. Oh, look, oh, look who's here. This is, um, Trina Parks, obviously. Thumper from, uh, from Diamonds Are Forever. Um, Hi, how are you? <laughs> if anybody here lives in Palm Springs, they know I just drove in. That's where I live. <laughs> That's why I just got here. 
Oh my gosh. Well, I, I, this freeway. <laughs> <laughs> In Palm Springs, we have nobody there. <laughs> they didn't fly you so up for this or anything like that? Hmm? They, they didn't fly you up they for didn't I heard you speaking about how they treat us. <laughs> now that I'm not <laughs> on the set, no, I had to drive in. Oh, gosh. So glad to be here, though. Well, you have the, the distinction of being, uh, you have sort of two distinctions here. One is that um, you uh, were the first African-American Bond girl. Um, and uh, Thank you. Thank you. Plus villain. Plus a villain, <laughs> right. Um, you also um, have been in some, some other sort of iconic movies, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, yeah. the Blues, Bro Blues Brothers. You did a... James uh, Brown. <laughs> a Night Gallery episode that show terrified me when I was growing up, so thank you for that. Um, I was crazy then. <laughs> yeah. But um, you worked with Sean Connery... Um, in his last official James Bond yeah. movie. We don't count uh, Never Say Never, really. Um, so uh, what, were you, was he, um, what was he like in the last throes of James Bond here? Was he, st was he still into the part? Do you, I mean, you, basic, you got to know him well enough to like wrap your legs around him and throw him oh, across yes. the room. <laughs> <laughs> A couple of times. <laughs> yeah. But he was really great to work with. He was really, and he did a lot more stunts. Well, we all did a lot more stunts then <laughs> than they do now. But yeah, he was he was fine. He was into it, but he wanted to finish that film. He did. Yeah, you, he was he a sort of a reluctant Bond yeah. at that point? Do you think, or N not to portray it on the set? No, no. Was, um, was it a, a? Were people aware that you were the first African American? I Bond? wasn't aware. <laughs> <laughs> It's just you and, I, I and Bambi were there to... Yeah. To, um, I had no clue, because I came from the, as Gloria knows, from, from Broadway, and actually I started out as a dancer with uh, 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 Catherine Dunham and Donnie McHale and Anna Sokolow's company, and back, you know, and I was a dancer, and uh, then into Broadway, and then when I, I came here and I signed with APA, uh, they, they actually called you then, you know, no emails at that time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. they <laughs> they, and called you and I uh, said, well, you know, would you like to go up for this, uh, the James Bond uh, role? And I said, <laughs> <laughs> I was not aware really of the film, film, film area, you know? And I said, yeah, sure, great. Of course I'd like to go up for it. You know, and uh, but you know, when I got to this uh, to the the audition or the interview, I was the only one there. And usually, when you're at auditions, you know, or interviews, you have at least two or three other ladies or so. None. So I mean, I just was up for a part. They told me what it was. They wanted uh, someone who did karate because I didn't know karate from being in, in Catherine Dunham's company, and uh, also danced, not just do karate or just dance. So I had both of those, and did a little acting, you know? For some reason, I've always imagined you getting cast with Bambi at the same time. No. I don't know, that's just my imagination. <laughs> no, I, I didn't even see her, the character, until I got on the set. And um, she was actually who you saw, uh, what's her name, uh, Lola, Lola Larson. She was really a replacement for another actress that was on the set. So, which was uh, kind of good because she was uh, gymnastic. She was in gymnastics, and this was her first, first film. You know, she hardly even spoke. She was like maybe 16, 17. But she was fabulous, of course. She, 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 did, she did every single, every single step. What, was anybody see. hurt Everything. in, in uh, no. Nope. no near drowning in the swimming pool? Almost, nothing? but no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, that was really a shot. The shot where they come running in, the FBI comes running in, and we're under, under Sean is under, I mean, sir. Sean is on the <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> it has us under all that time. All that time. We're under there. It's not that we got out, went in our dressing room and just, you know, looked at television. We are under there. They're coming, they're running in, they're talking to Sean, and we're under That's there. It's like 30 seconds underwater there, at least, oh, it, right? It felt like half hour. <laughs> yeah. It was a long time. So when I come up, and I'm like that. 
that's real. <laughs> that's not acting. Really, it was. I'm, I'm, I'm serious. I'm serious. I was wondering while I was down there. Good thing I was in my 20s. I mean, not 20s. I, I was early, stop, younger stop than stop that. It. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, I mean, I could swim a little bit. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think um, I'm supposed to open this up for questions from the audience. I think you, they may be written down somewhere. Is that how it's working? Or, um, well, while I'm waiting to figure that out, um, there's something I've always, I've always wanted to ask you who your favorite James Bond is. <laughs> I'm going to ask uh, all of you, but... but <laughs> Present company accepted. What do you think of the new the new Bond? What do you think of um, the the progress of the character? Is it is it a part you guys, as you, if you were young actors today, would it be a franchise you'd still want to get involved in? And oh, absolutely, I think Daniel Craig is awesome. Yes. Awesome. When I first saw him, <laughs> when I first saw Daniel Craig. When I first saw him, you know, they were publicizing he was going to be James Bond. I said, no way. No way. The guy's too little. Yeah. And he looks too evil. And he's not handsome enough. But honey, <laughs> when we saw Casino Royale, yes. that first movie, they were running up and down buildings and stuff. I went, oh. He looked like he was seven feet tall. And, and, his, and, and his demeanor, I mean, hmm, that was a man. Because <laughs> you wouldn't mind grabbing a hold of him. You know what I mean, ladies? <laughs> like uh, George. <laughs> well, we all love George. No, George, you are a hunk. Yeah, you are. <laughs> George. I'll take it. When you became Bond, I mean, you were com you were right after Connery at his peak. Where he was Connery was that must have been, um, as you were saying, you were scared shitless at the audition. How did you Aren't feel we? when when you uh, actually had to sit down and do the role? Well, you know, I had nothing to lose. <laughs> I came from male modeling, for Christ's sake. And, uh, it was, uh, you know, and I was, uh, you've got to imagine a guy who's overconfident. That's how I got the role. So Connery was always the other guy, you know. The other fellow, that's where that line came from. I said, I bet the other fellow never had to do this. Or when I, he wouldn't step down a step, apparently. So meanwhile, uh, I'm jumping out of helicopters and doing all my fight scenes and pulling my shoulder out and still carrying on working and doing things like that. And I say, bet the other fellow never had to do this. <laughs> and, they, and I was in the um, accounting office one day, and I, this is another little trick I had. They're giving me my per diem, which was uh, $100 a week, which was money in those days. Today you can't buy an ice cream. <laughs> but I, I, I was getting my $100, and Harry Saltzman happened to be there. And the accountant, and I said, how much the other fella get? And, and Harry looked at the accountant and he said, tell him, a thousand. And I gave him another look and he said, okay, give him a thousand. <laughs> Just like that. That was the male model car salesman in me. <laughs> and I, uh, and so, so this line in the movie where you say that never happened to the other fella? That was my line. I wrote that. It's, it's just like this weird meta moment in that movie yeah. where you're sort of winking to the audience about the fact that there's a new bit Bond in the movie, and yeah. it turns out this is like your personal catchphrase, basically. Yeah, it, uh, <laughs> it was, uh, you know, just very Australian. What about the other fellow never had to do this? <laughs> <laughs> well, this never happened to the other fella. He's just the other fella. And, uh, you know, Sean's my favorite Bond, you know, and uh, I had, and I thought, or I was told by my manager that if I stayed in it, I'd be dead meat. And that's why I left, because I thought it was his gig. Hippies were in, John, uh, Bond's over. This is, the guy, much I knew. this is the guy who convinced you to wear a beard to the opening of... Yeah, uh, well, he didn't convince me. I was wearing it. Well, and, what was uh, going on here? You, you, you sort of fell in with, with somebody who, who thought Bond was over. sort of evil and over and mm. part of the military. Yeah, it was make love, not war in those days. And... Uh, 
the girls got the pill for Christ's sake, you know. It was make love, not war. And it was working. But, but you know, people who are into guns and stuff like that, the movies weren't going anywhere. Easy Rider was a big hit. And then Bruce Lee came along, and uh, that's how I got my break back in the movies. I couldn't work after I gave up Bond, because every time I get a job, they'd get a phone call, and I was still under contract to them. And so uh, uh, I, had, I went sailing for 15 months, ran out of money, and then uh, went over to see Bruce Lee on a charter flight, got a bus out to the studio, and I was with him 10 minutes, and he gave me 10 grand to do a movie with him. The guy who you, uh, who, who you sort of spell you fell under, did you ever have the conversation with him, what the hell did you do to my life? I mean, no. Did you, did you... no, he came to my wedding when I wasn't talking to him anymore, and uh, uh, this girl that told me she couldn't get pregnant, I was on a boat with her, I said, you poor thing, you know, come <laughs> with me, we'll go sailing. And fifth, <laughs> next thing I know, uh, she's eight months pregnant, and we go back to um, <laughs> London, and so, uh, and then I found out that, uh, and I, I was a hippie by that stage. I, you know, I had the earring and the long hair and, and everything. And meanwhile, they came to me for the next Bond. And uh, I think it was Hamilton who directed the next one after, uh, that Sean did, uh, uh, after me. The one the, after Never Say Never Again? No, the one after mine that Sean did. They called um, me back into the office and I was skinny as a uh, rake uh, and because I'd been sailing for 15 months and I couldn't catch any fish. I was hardly eating. <laughs> it was terrible. And, uh, I, uh, and they said, look at him. He can't play James Bond, the director said. Oh, no. But they were going to give me another shot. And, well, uh, after all that, they were still willing to give you another shot. Mm -hmm. That's impressive. Yeah, Kevin Broccoli and the director in, uh, in L.A. I was, and they were, called me in the office. And the previous time he called me in the office, uh, Kevin, I was living with this girl, I won't mention any names, but I was driving her Ferrari around. And uh, Cubby called me up and said, uh, you better come and see me. This is your life I'm talking about here. And I, to, I, I got her to drive me to where Cubby lived, and I was behind her in the Ferrari, and she left, and I could find my way back to her place. So Cubby's up on the stairs, and I'll put it this way. He said, if the President of the United States called me up and said to get my butt up to Washington, I'd say I'll get there as uh, soon as I can, sir. But if the guy who bought that Ferrari told me to get my butt over to his place, I'll be there in my pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went back to her place, and she's crying. I said, what are you doing, trying to get me killed? Oh, we're just having so much fun. I'm going, yeah, right. <laughs> well, let me, let me uh, throw in some questions from the audience here. This one's for all of you, and we've touched a little bit on it, but there's a lot of stunts in Bond movies, obviously. It's, it's mo mostly about stunts. Yeah, how, much at, poor. At, at, um, how much of the stunts did you guys do yourself? I mean, were there stuntmen for your scenes? Were, or, did, you know, or was it all the good stuff all you did? The interesting... Go ahead, Oh, I, I did everything. Because, <laughs> I mean, that's what they wanted. I mean, I wasn't... It was not... Well, I guess you could call it stunts, but that was part of the... The scene that was what we were it was to almost do. like dance that, yeah that's what know? that's why i guess i got the role <laughs> i mean yeah. <laughs> yeah because they wanted that dance and that um you know and that karate too if you knew it you know which i did um all that scene that where i kick where uh, ba uh bambi has uh, sean <laughs> sir sean on uh, <laughs> his uh, neck and i'm on the ground and that kick turn around to that up to the, um, what we call the um, lion look or whatever. That's all me. I choreographed that. If I knew then, <laughs> oh, what I know now, you know, but no, that's what he wanted. He, he, um, uh, Steve, uh, stunt, did you work with the stunt man, Steve? Ah, oh, I can't think of his name. But he, you know, he kind of let us go and do, or let me go and do. For her, it was basically, they really wanted specific things, but they tried out a lot of things with me. I'm, I'm assuming when it was the same for you, the reason you were cast is that you were yeah. a professional yeah, ice could. skater, you know, ice capades even, yeah. right? Yeah. They were, um, That's a term out of the yeah. <laughs> history book. <laughs> yeah, so I did all that, plus I had skied a lot um, as a kid, so yeah. 
the the part, as I recall, I but mean, wait, I have one little story about sure. skiing. I was not supposed to tell anybody anything about Roger skiing, so I won't really tell you. I think the statute of limitations are up now. You can, yeah. Roger doesn't ski. It was hysterical. <laughs> he's he's he, the, he the boots are on a the boots are on nailed on a sled that are being pulled by a snowmobile. And Roger's going... <laughs> it's really sad. But, but I, did, I, did see, I did see Roger uh, cross-country ski um, on the sly. It was mostly for insurance reasons he wasn't skiing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is, just to <laughs> put a point on it, this is like one of the great skiing action sequences of all time. Yeah. And the guy's been lugged around by a snowmobile. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, just wanted to make sure. And yeah. I'd like to elaborate on the stunt situation by 73. And um, yours was in something like 72. 60, 72. Y y yeah. Yours was 72. Mm -hmm. So in my scene, my stunt coming through the door where I'm flipped over, mm -hmm. and when the first time Bond sees me, and, uh, you know, he grabs my hand and flipped me over. You're Mrs. Bond, yeah. right? You check into the hotel as Th Mrs. Bond. That was a Caucasian in blackface. <laughs> I had to say that because they did not have women of my hue stunt. There were no... Um, what we call colored back then? I don't know what yeah. we call. <laughs> I'm still wheeling about what we were called. But we had no women of color doing stunts. And the man had to be my son. Well, they had the smallest guy they could. They put the exact dress on him, and he was all blacked, blacking out. Well, you had a short, you had a short hair do it. Well, well I, when I, I, when, by the time that the light was on, and you saw me roll over on the bed. It was me with the wig putting on my head. I'm sorry. I'm trying to figure out what, what is the, the, even the racist logic of saying you can't have black women do stunts. What was the... There was just none. There was, they, they weren't... We didn't, we didn't do movies like that. Action movie for, for people of color wasn't really around then. For women. Men, yeah. yeah. But the men did the work. But not the women. And most of the, uh, most of us, I'm so sorry, mo there weren't movies around with women of color, of my you, that were doing stunts, or even in a movie that called for them to to be fighting, etc. Cetera, and etc. Cetera, without maybe like a smack or something, you know. And you didn't see us tumbling all over the place because we didn't have movies like that. And the black exploitation was the renaissance from the 40s from Michelle, who was a person of color, who, so we, we had movies back then, but they were mostly love stories and re, you know, et cetera, with women being in their place and et cetera. We were housewives well, back then. Live and Let Die was, was sort of a response to the success of a lot of the black exploitation movies that were, were happening at that point, right? Like well, Superfly. Or, yeah, or exactly, exactly. Well, the, well, then, yes, but a lot of those ladies were doing some of their own stunts, but they weren't really what you call a union of black stunt women. You see, because we're in the union. So they did, but they, it wasn't a part of the union. Can, when you look at that film now, does, I mean, in some respects, it's it's pretty dated in in the the sort of social vibe of it, it feels kind of a little strange. Like when's the last time you heard the word honky in a movie is just exactly. it doesn't come up often these days. But, exactly. Um, but it's it, almost back. It's almost back. <laughs> <laughs> what, what what's interesting about you two is is that you caught Roger Moore at his first Bond movie, and you caught him. Well, it wasn't quite his last, but it was getting second, there, right? Second to last. Yeah. 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 So you got the whole, and he was Bond for like Six. two generations yeah. worth of. Yeah, of, 12 years. Yeah. Um, yeah. So have you guys, do you guys compare notes? You sit down and sort of. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I never thought of that. <laughs> it's something to think about. <laughs> Because we do get together. We hang out well, sometimes. Yeah. I find that yeah. really sweet that there's this sort of, of sort of group 
that, that gets together. This, I was saying backstage, it's, it's, you're sort of like astronauts, you know? There's only so many people who get to land on the moon. There's only so many people who get to be in James Bond movies. And to get to be in his bed. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't make it, though. You, uh, I not... was in his bed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I was in his bed, and my parents were there watching that day, which was really... <laughs> How old Roger were you when, when, thought it was, was like 16 when you were doing this, or were you... I was uh, 19 or so, 20. Mentally, I was about 14. <laughs> yeah. Well, you use that in the part. I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's a really... It's not often there's a sort of comic note in the Bond well, girls think, that you got to I play. I think that got really silly and funny because my parents were there. We were shooting a couple days before Christmas, so my parents came over and uh, we're doing this scene and, and um, Roger, you know, Roger would never do a scripted line. He would always throw something out funny. I imagine all the Bonds do that, right? No. <laughs> so, so the director would finally say, okay, for this take, let's just do the scripted line. Let's just do one scripted line. So, um, um, but Roger would say things like, you know, well, I would jump in the sack with you, but your parents are standing right there, you know? <laughs> or the, the stuntman gave me... He's such a coward. <laughs> The stuntman gave me um, a, a rubber duck, which, you know, it, it, and, and the, like I said before, this is a family. They've done all these jokes a thousand times, probably. So there was always a rubber duck hanging out somewhere, right? So uh, 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 somebody came up to me and said, um, I have this rubber duck under the, under the blanket here, and when Roger comes to you, you just offer him the duck, okay? <laughs> so they, they've so, gotten to the point that there's practical jokes just going on. Oh yeah, because oh. the the movie that they show with the outtakes for for the actor for Roger, I think, was as important as the real movie to be released. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read another question from the, the audience here. Um, this is for all of you guys. What is the scariest thing that ever happened to you while shooting a Bond film? <laughs> Getting dunked in the pool. Oh, yeah. When I was lying there on the ground and um, they had this honey, well, whatever you call this blood on me and the ants were crawling on me uh. on the ground. And I was thinking they were crawling in my ear and told me, you can't move, you can't breathe, you're supposed to be dead. <laughs> and I'm lying there with my eyes open <laughs> and the ants are all around me. It was awful. Yeah, that sounds very glamorous. That, uh... Oh, what we do is actors. Yeah. <laughs> what we do. How about when you have to take off your, you, you're in your bathing suit, it's supposed to be the middle of summer, and you're in your bathing suit walking along the beach in a love scene, and it's 20 degrees. <laughs> how about you? How about George? What was your scariest moment, aside from getting the part? <laughs> Good one. Good one. <laughs> Well, after I became James Bond, I never got scared. <laughs> no, I, I can remember jumping out of this helicopter, and uh, we're at 10,000 feet, so the helicopter can hardly fly anyway. And every time someone would jump out, the helicopter would go up about four feet. And I was the last one to jump out. And I'm thinking, this is crazy. And uh, but I guess, you know, if I break my legs, I'll have to wait till they fix them. So I jumped out and hit the ice, and I had spikes on my shoes, which made it worse, because it stops you dead. And then they had this wire that pulled me along the ice, <laughs> shooting a machine gun. But th that was all a stunt I did. And then afterwards, I was talking to the stuntman. He said, I'd be careful if I were you. I said, what do you mean? He said, we told Peter you shouldn't be doing this. Peter Hunt, the director. Mm. And I said, what did he say? He said, shit, if we kill him, we can do it again. <laughs> we got it all again. No one's seen him yet. <laughs> yeah. Though I did all my own stunts. That's, um, I guess you got a little more comfortable when they got some film in the can, then you became kind of indispensable, but uh, early not, on. Not necessarily. You see, they hadn't seen me. They get insurance because they kill me, and they can do it all again, and most directors would like to have a second shot at the same time. <laughs>
Well, the joke's on him. You made it through the whole movie. Yeah. And, and I, did, I did run into him afterwards. He was walking past my house. I had a fancy area in London. I said, Peter, it's me. He said, I know, and he took off. <laughs> <laughs> He did, literally. He, did, he ran off the... Ran down the yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to uh, do another question from the audience. Um, I'm addressing these to all of you because they're all pertinent questions, I guess. But looking back in, in your career, are there any scenes that you regret having done or should have done better or done in a different way? When you look back at these movies, and it doesn't have to be a Bond movie, but I mean, yeah. in... In general, are you the type of people who pick apart what you've done um, after you've done it, or do you just try not to ever look at it again? Well, I, in, in uh, my movie, um, Dogtown Strutters, uh, co-starring um, Roger Mosley and Stan Shaw, um, there was a scene in there where I had to play a um, character of um, a nun. I didn't like that. <laughs> Because the nun it was... They get nothing. They, <laughs> <laughs> Can I sit over there? <laughs> Stop. Um, <laughs> she... I mean, I'm spiritual. I'm not religious, religious. But I, you know, I respect other religions and, and, and uh, practices. And I just didn't quite like having to play the nun and be all <laughs> like I was tough. It was a comedy, but it was like a dark comedy, if anybody has ever seen the movie. And uh, so, so that playing was a, like a, a tough a, nun was the Yeah. Your, uh, yeah. Uh, Georgia, is there a similar dark, uh, uh, tough nun in your uh, <laughs> background that you would Well, it's a little different, <laughs> but. Uh, I can remember in the army getting horny over nuns walking past me. <laughs> Just the smell of a woman. No, it was like there was no other woman around, you know, for months. Talk about a movie. Uh, talking about a movie. But, uh... Movie, movie. You'd, well, I was 18, for God's sake, you know. Uh, but, uh, yeah, a movie. I, I was in, uh... <laughs> I was in Singapore doing Hawaii Five O, and this is how I got this job. Some woman yelled out the window at Warner Brothers and said, George, can you go to Singapore straight away? The actor apparently got sick and couldn't go, and they wanted me over there for Hawaii Five O. Jack Law didn't. When he saw me, he said, what are you doing here? What's he doing here? Because, you, know, you know, I'm prettier than him. So, <laughs> and so he dressed me down and made me grow a beard and, a, and got me suits that didn't fit, and I played this like uh, out-of-work homeless guy. And meanwhile, at night, I was drinking with Ben Kazara, who uh, was doing uh, St. Jack there, uh, a m movie about... Uh, and they wanted the, someone to, to play a gay American senator. He said, you'd be perfect for it. And I said, what do you, makes you think that? <laughs> I said, there's no way I'm going to do this. But after about five nights of drinking with him, I said, yeah, I'll do it. And uh, the... The hard scene was when they had this new kid come into the room and uh, Ben's supposedly looking through a keyhole to see what this American center is up to. It's in Singapore. You know, Singapore was built for the Vietnam vets, R&R. &R. America built Singapore. So we were doing something about that. I don't remember the whole story because I just read my lines. And uh, meanwhile, uh, meanwhile, he comes into the room and I've got a touch him and look like I'm about to take my clothes off and that was it but I tell you what I did it so well that's probably the best moment I've had in movies apart from the last one in James Bond where I cried and I did it with tears the first time and Peter Hunt says do it again James Bond doesn't cry <laughs> so but if they left that take in there it was a really good one. I was I was nine months acting by that time I was learning how to do it <laughs> The, the take in at the end of, of on Her, Her Majesty's Secret Service, I, I don't remember. Are you crying or not in that, in that scene? I was crying in the first take. But they don't, the they don't take, use that take. I was just mumbling away, uh, you know, being, you know, losing my wife that I hadn't... We have all the time. I hadn't had the honeymoon yeah. yet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like a friend of mine tears. said the other day, there was two guys, two teenagers uh, talking, and I can relate to this. They're saying, geez, I'm tired. And he said, why are you tired? He said, oh, my girlfriend, she just wants to go all night. And this guy about my age turns around and says, you want to stop that, mate? Get married. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> what about you guys uh, on this question here? The uh, looking back on your career, are there moments that you would take back? Uh, looking back at my career, I have to look way yonder back. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I feel like I'm living another life on another planet now. I, I <coughs> excuse me. I don't even. I don't, uh, when I see stuff, I don't even really look at it to see, oh, wow, I would have done. I don't know, it's like uh, it, my daughter is closer to that age. So if you had asked me this maybe 20 years ago, I might have been able to give you probably a list of maybe 100 things that I might have done differently. But, you know, I'm, I'm in another world now. When's the last time you saw Ice Castle? Um, Actually, it was a bit ago. We were went skiing with uh, uh, another family, and they showed it. Yeah, that must have been fun. <laughs> it, it is. I mean, it, it's it's. I, I'm I'm just so bloody old. I just, I just <laughs> not when, for when me. <laughs> How about you? Are there are there? Any bits that you would take back or wish you could do differently? Absolutely. And I think um, <clears throat> to say, um, you know, it's terrible, as I say terrible, when you're in need of funds to pay your rent. And um, you get a, a film that you know damn well you would never do if you had your, if you could pay your rent and take care of yourself. And you hadn't worked in over a year or two years, and et cetera, and you couldn't get a commercial, and couldn't get a print job, couldn't get a voiceover. Well, I did. My agent said, you'll be sorry. He dropped me. Yes, he did. He dropped me. I took the movie. I said, you kidding me? I haven't worked in two years. He said, you'll be sorry. And I am. I really am. The whole experience. Matter of fact, from the time I got off that plane, when I got on the plane, it took me 22 hours to get there, just about. I shot it in the Philippines. Um, Manila Rizal, I stayed at the Intercontinental Hotel. And during that time, they had a militia. <laughs> and everybody had to stay in their hotel, stay in their room, a shootout. <laughs> And then my driver quit because he said, if my father knew I was driving a black person, and he quit. And the prejudice was enormous in the Philippines for me. Um, and I had to hang out with the, the Air Force, plus the filming of the particular movie, which I don't want to give you the title. The, I, was the, I was the lead, my first leading lady movie. I was the absolute lead. And the second lead was a young lady who was the opposite hue. She was furious. She said, I'm the star. And she tried to pick a fight with me. I'm totally looking you up on IMDb when we come out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to give you the title. But it is in my book because I wrote a book. It was one of, I was there for three months. And during that shoot, I really was concentrated I mean, I was very concentrated on my role, and the, the film had all kinds of things in it I would never do. And the experience with it, to go with it, and it didn't pay a lot of money, but I could pay my rent when I came home. So it, it doesn't really pay to do that. You gotta figure something else out. In other words, as actors, we all have another gig, I'm sure. So, you know, keep nurturing that other position because there's not one famous person that doesn't have something else going. Mm -hmm. And I observed that. I said, wow, Barbara Streisand's got what? What? Suzanne Summers got what? Oh my God, so and so and so has got what? Every, uh, Paul Newman's got what? <laughs> I mean, every, every one of them have something else going. So don't ever forget that. Yeah, in other words, another job, another profession, uh, something that they have been cultivating and they can go to to get money. 
I don't care if it's writing or you might be selling, um, you, might have, you might be selling clothes online. You might be selling, in other words, there's something else you do besides act because acting don't, it will do you in <laughs> because, it, because it changes all the time. Agents change, people change. It would be different if it didn't. You can really have a family. The only thing that doesn't change is that there are always going to be James Bond movies, apparently. Isn't that the truth? Yes. There's always going to be James Bonds and Bond girls. And um, it, I, I can't tell you what a treat it was for me to meet three Bond girls and a James Bond all in one <laughs> evening. Um, and I'm really glad that I got a chance to do this and you've all been really charming and funny. And, Thank, you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.